Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Dennis Acheson. Thanks for joining us today. Our guest is Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance Party of New Brunswick. Considered the dark horse in the election, but people may be surprised. At the beginning of any election, consider it like the beginning of a sports season. Everything's level, playing field's level. But maybe in today's conversation, we'll explore how to keep it more open, more transparent, and more accessible for everyday people. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you, Dennis. Good to be here. Um, there was a story in the Gleaner, or in Brunswick News, not too long ago with you and David Kuhn saying they would be kings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you have any thought, or whoever the headline writer is, is a fascinating character because mm -hmm. they're trying to sell papers. Right. But and interesting that Jennifer McKenzie wasn't um, referred to as mm -hmm. kings and queens. Right. Um, but it did at least convey the message that there was more than two choices this election round. Do um, mm -hmm. you want to play with what the media did with your image <laughs> during that window? Well, I mean, you know, when you do interviews um, with, with media, you, you never know, of course, what the outcome is going to be. Um, you know, I was asked, uh, I believe it was Katrina Clark that had done, done the story, and asked, you know, some very basic questions about the election and, and what we're feeling. And, and I was very honest. I said, you know, um, there, there's areas of this province where we feel huge momentum. And uh, we're seeing it. Uh, we're, we're seeing it in our growth. We're seeing it in, in uh, new people coming on to help support uh, um, interest from people wanting to be candidates. Uh, you know, quite a wide gamut of, of support and momentum that, that we're sensing. So... You know, it just uh, she asked the question. I, I responded best way I knew how, and, and with the information, and uh, I guess that was the outcome. And that's what comes out. That's what comes out. Because a lot of people in general don't see the full process. Mm -hmm. They'll just see the end result. Right. So this is what media decided to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, from a, from a political side, I mean, there there are certain articles that that you kind of think you know that this is good, and uh, either a it. it encapsulated the truth of the conversation or b it was politically good you, you know in that sense there are other times where you feel like you know they didn't capture the essence of what i was really saying you know maybe a certain part was taken not necessarily out of context but it didn't encapsulate the whole the whole conversation yeah. and that's just the way this thing works right i mean you you give the best answer that, that yeah. you know you you respond and that's but, why people need to go and find out for themselves through social media. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, we're, we're big advocates of that. I mean, I've been very critical in the past of, uh, you know, the papers and, and mainstream media in general. And I'll still say, I mean, we, we don't always get a fair shake mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, you know uh, getting our message out and... and Making people aware that again, this isn't a two two pony race anymore. Yeah. Times are changing. You look across the globe; uh, everybody is just fed up with with this just kind of uh, system of government that just chugs along, um, mm -hmm. where where it's this elitist type of thinking. And and people say, you know what? Like we we want our government back, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm hearing in New Brunswick. You know, the two party system has has gotten the province to such a dismal state, and uh, people want their province back. So do you want to be king? <laughs> I, I don't know about king. I, I mean, again, the wording, you know. Because most people, <coughs> they'll see the newspaper. Mm -hmm. They read the headline. Mm -hmm. They maybe read the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. And that's the impression. And that's that's and, that's the problem. I mean, and again, we don't control that in any way. They, they mm -hmm. do what they're going to do. Um, what I want to do is I want to bring change in the province. You know, I, I'm... I'm geared towards uh, policies and ideas that that are kind of outside the box, but have some rational thinking mm -hmm. to them, mm -hmm. and and some you know uh, information that can back up what we what we want to do. So, mm. I mean, my my objective is to get uh, get as many of us elected as, as we can, mm -hmm. work hard in doing that, and once we're in there, um, you know whether we you know have the opportunity to form government. Or whether we have the opportunity to hold a balance of power, to me, equally uh, can can be important in in riding the ship on the right course. Following that theme, and if we can keep playing in that space for a little bit, there was another story in the paper shortly after they would be kings. But mm -hmm. when we'll talk about Miss McKenzie and being queen, who has this headline with uh, this was Monday, July the ninth, where it's race to fill party ranks, and we started late, and they show a picture of Miss McKenzie talking to a, a person. Then the theme of the story implies that you need to have candidates in all 49 ridings, and if you don't, somehow you're somehow less than. 
Mm. Um, the three political scientists they spoke to um, framed it that way. The person who wrote the story, Adam Harris, uh, framed it that way. Mm -hmm. And it's got a negative tone to it for those that don't have all of their candidates filled out in all the constituencies. Um, can we play with that a bit? Mm -hmm. Because um, do you think it's a valid criticism or observation? And if not, then where's the strength in not having every spot filled? Well, I, I think a lot of it depends on, uh, y like for us, I mean, I can only speak for ourselves. We've been here now, this will be our third election. And uh, I'll be honest, when I first get into it, I was somewhat naive to think that, uh, you know, the whole province is going to come on board and we're going to get this moving really quickly. Um, it, it has been a, a long, slow process. But where we're at today, um, and I mean, you can see it in, in the way we're being attacked. I mean, you know, especially from the Conservative Party. I mean, they're coming out, you know, I said I had to duck the other day because I thought the kitchen sink was coming at me. They're, they're throwing everything at us. And that's, that's good because that tells me that we are indeed gaining the momentum that I think we're gaining and, and that I'm seeing on the ground. So, you know, yes, I mean, I, I, our goal is always to have 49 seats, fill as many uh, electoral districts as possible. Um, that is the target on the wall. Uh, if we fall short of that, then as many as possible. And but but people have to realize that at the end of the day, uh, there's there's 49 seats in the legislature, and you only need uh, you know the majority of those seats to to form government, in terms of a majority government. And then there's the the aspect again of a minority government where you only need a few seats in the middle where you can actually control the balance of power. And, and it's those seats in the middle that can be just as uh, effective as government itself. One of the challenges with how media frame the narrative around elections is they make it very difficult to get across anything new, mm -hmm. another new perspective, another new way of doing things, and another new path to governance mm -hmm. because they're so entrenched with the same pattern. And that's why I wanted to bring this up because they're at it again pounding that, you know, you're not going to be legitimate unless you have candidates in all 49 constituencies. Maybe the emphasis should be on talent right. and that if you've got 10 or 12 really good candidates mm -hmm. in 10 or 12 contested constituencies, then that puts that conversation in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And then that in turn encourages democratic process. Yeah. Rather than, well, you'll never be in power because you don't have 49 candidates in 49 constituencies. Right. Right. So is that the space you're trying to fill? Well, yeah. I mean, again, our, our objective is to get as many candidates as possible, run with our message as we've been doing. I mean, people say the campaign, you know, is, is kicking off. Well, for us, the campaign's been going for the last several years. Yeah. We've held town halls in every corner of this province, mm -hmm. you know, getting our message out. We've been up north. We've been in the south, east, west. I mean, we, we've literally been everywhere in New Brunswick, uh, driving the message home. And, and people would say... You know, when we would have these town halls and we would talk about our, our message, people would say, well, should you be talking about that? The election's not for another two years. And we said, well, yes, we should, because we want people to know what we stand for. We want people to get an idea of, of what our thinking is and how we're going to govern. So now, of course, you ramp that up because we are a couple uh, months away from the election. But look, we've been going nonstop for the yep. last uh, few years driving this message home. Yep. We'll get into some of that content in a second. I've got one more piece in that puzzle sure. of how media frame things. Um, it ties to polling. So we'll get regular reports from mainstream media about this poll says this mm -hmm. and this poll says that. Of, of to date, the ones that have come out mention only the two parties 90% mm -hmm. of the time. The pleasure of social media is that people will put conversations up there that mainstream media won't report on. Right. So here's a post from a, a fellow through the social media Facebook world, and it's from uh, June 14th. It says, for the voters of Moncton South, I wonder who hired National Public Research Canada, a subsidiary of voter contact firm, Prime Contact Group, to call voters outside the riding and ask who they would vote for. The call gave two choices, Kathy Rogers or Moira Murphy, hmm. a liberal and a conservative. Right. So if pollsters shade the question from the get-go, mm -hmm. and in media report polls as if they're true right. or an accurate reflection, um, what do you do to counter that? Well, I, I, again, I think 
let, let's face it. Social <laughs> media has added a whole new dynamic to information getting out to the public. Um, and, and, and we've utilized that as a party strongly. Uh, social media is our number one method of getting you know, the information out to the people. The good thing about it is kind of like what we're doing here. This is unscripted. Uh, it's unedited for the most part. I'm sure you'll edit the first in the end. Yeah. But when we start until we end, we're 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 going here. It's so, authentic. Yeah, and uh, it's it's those types of things. I you know I do once in a while too with the Rogers Voice of the Province with with Jeff Dapre, and uh, it's the same thing. It's just you know here here it is, and, and then, but on the flip side, um, with with mainstream media in general. Um, you know, they say for time constraints or whatever, and I understand that, but they have to edit the content. So you don't always get the true meaning of the conversation. Uh, you, you know, you get a tidbit out of there. Um, they have a product to sell like any business, uh, and they will sell what people will buy. And unfortunately, when you look at the polls in, in mainstream media, I, I, think, I think the reason why you're seeing this gradual decline um, you know, with, you say, subscriptions to papers or, you know, interest in the mainstream media is for that reason. The market, if we can call it that, in the public is changing all the time. You have to be able to change with it. And the public now, they want, they want raw information. They don't want scripted information. They don't want edited information. They, they want it real and, and in their face kind of thing. And, um, they're, they're just not offering it the way that, that social media is. Yep. And to follow up on that last point, I did some research before you came on. Um, in the Facebook world, the Liberals have 3,900 followers. The Green Party have 3,600 followers. People's Alliance have 2,800 followers. NDP have 2,000 followers. And the Conservatives have 1,600 followers. That you won't find in a mainstream news story. Mm -hmm. Yep. But it does indicate there's a conversation going on mm -hmm. somewhere else that's very powerful. Yep. Do you have any stories or anecdotes yet from um, traveling around the province or social media interactions where uh, you're finding um, traction or you're finding um, friction? Um, well, look, there's, there's a plethora of issues out there. Yeah. Uh, the paramedic crisis is a huge one. Uh, both from people that are paramedics that, that work it every day, um, but just as importantly, people that need the service, especially in rural areas. I know in urban mm -hmm. areas it's a, it's not quite as bad, but uh, in out in the country and in, in smaller municipalities, people some people are waiting 30, 35 minutes. I mean, I'll never forget, you know, the the, the picture of the lady in St. Quentin that was being loaded in the back of an SUV because they waited 45 minutes for an ambulance that didn't show up. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that, that was a picture of what's going on across the province in terms of our paramedics. So that's, that's a big issue. Taxation's always an issue. You talk to business owners, they're being taxed to death. Um, you know, the language file often comes up where people feel like, and most people you talk to say, look, we, we understand this is a, a you know, a, a diverse demographic and the fact that we have French and English, New Brunswickers, and that they, both of them deserve service in their language of choice. We certainly don't argue that. We support that. But how they roll that out and how they implement it has become a huge issue as well. So there's there's lots of issues out there. Um, you know, long wait times in hospitals, emergency rooms, yep. long wait times to see specialists, education, the list goes on and on. So let's dig into one or two of those as a, a way of giving this some meat a bit. Mm -hmm. um, use the ambulance one. Um, is the issue, from your point of view, um, staffing? And does that staffing then tie to how media reported on the bilingual aspect of mm -hmm. staffing? Yeah, it, it staffing, staffing really isn't the issue. Okay. To be honest, from from, from what we're hearing, what we what we've dug up, the issue is is language uh, at at the very center of it, and and the reason is this: we met with the Paramedic Association of New Brunswick to get a feel for what's going on here. If it, is it a recruitment issue? Is it re, you know retaining paramedics? What what's happening? And they assured us that there is more than enough paramedics in New Brunswick that are willing and want to work. But they want to work permanent, full-time jobs. It's this idea where you can get a few weeks here or you can get a six-month gig, uh, but after that, you know, you, you, you may not have that, that full permanent work. It's, so it's, those are the hiring practices currently? Yes, for people that are not bilingual, for, for paramedics that are not bilingual, Thank right? You. If you're bilingual... No problem. And what's happening is the bilingual paramedics, on the other hand, they're being overworked. 
So because, you know, the government has put this high threshold on bilingual staff, bilingual paramedics are being overworked. Unilingual paramedics are not getting full-time permanent jobs. So what they've done, the government's come out and they're, they're, they're calling it a, rec- a recruitment issue, that there's not enough paramedics. Well, that's, that's total hogwash. There's all yep. kinds of paramedics. That's not the truth. But what they're doing is they're offering the paramedic course through the Francophone Community College. Now, if, if someone wanted to take the, the paramedic course in French, they can go to the community college, and if they fall under the threshold of the tuition access bursary program, they can essentially get their tuition free. Mm-hmm. So you can go to be a paramedic in the French community college, receive your free um, uh, tuition, and off you go. The problem is, there is first of all, there are no paramedic courses offered in, in any of the English uh, community colleges or universities. So where are they getting their training? They have to go to a private college. So they have to pay out of pocket, which is much more than the public training that's okay. being offered in the, in the Francophone Community College. And I want to be clear about this, Dennis. We don't oppose Francophone Community Colleges offering the paramedic course. We encourage them to do it. Yeah. But it has to be equal. You, you have to be able to say, look, we're going to offer it in the Francophone Community Colleges, but we're also going to offer it in the Anglophone uh, community colleges, uh, you know, New Brunswick Community College, that sort of thing. Yeah, because it's about access. Well, it should be. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you wear rightly or wrongly as a, as a political party is there are some who believe that your origins were with the core party. Is there some way to settle that? Uh, maybe by my age. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I would have been... I mean, I don't know. I, I don't. Like, I mean, where, hear, where does that come from? In the first I think. Place, it, well, you know? it's it's based on our obviously our issue on language. Okay. And I don't back away from that. I look. I if people want to draw conclusions or misinterpret what we're saying, I mean that that's that's part of the, the process, and, and okay. they can have at it. But the reality is, we've been very clear from the start what we're saying on language. We support the right of French and English residents to receive service in their language of choice. Mm. We do not support duality. We think it's absolutely ridiculous that you cannot put French and English children on the same bus. We oppose that. We oppose dual health authorities where millions of dollars are being wasted for administrative simply based on language. Uh, We want all of that duality stuff to go, and, and we're going to eliminate those things. Then we want bilingualism implemented in a fair and, and proportionate manner that's based on your demographic and based on your need. So if you have centralized services, and I always refer to, say, the Heart Center in St. John. Well, that Heart Center looks after all of New Brunswick and I think other provinces as well. So there obviously is going to be a higher threshold for bilingual staff mm-hmm. to maintain that central service. That's reasonable because mm-hmm. you have francophones up north in different areas of the province that may have to utilize that service. But when you're talking about a service New Brunswick in St. Stephen or paramedics in Doaktown, you know, having this high threshold of bilingual requirements, that's where we have the issue. And what people don't understand is every single ambulance that is on the road today has a dedicated translation line that can be used for any language that's needed. And it's been used for other languages, but the language commissioner and the government will not allow it to be used for French. So that's where the issue comes up for us. <coughs> Excuse me. No, interesting. Um, a couple of things buried in there. One was at one day New Brunswick's got to get used to more than just two languages. Yeah. Because that's coming. Yeah. Um, might not be as entrenched in in rights and freedoms sure. and constitution as much, but at the same time, in terms of wanting an inclusive society, mm-hmm. um, the ability to serve people, especially from a government perspective, mm-hmm. is going to start to involve other languages at some point. Mm-hmm. So interesting to learn about the language line or the translation line. Well, you look at like the city of Toronto, for example. There's a city of over 4 million people. Mm-hmm. They deal with multiple, multiple dialects and languages and cultures and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And you never hear of Toronto being in this uproar over language. Yeah. Here in New Brunswick, we can't deal with two. Well, it's, that speaks to another thing, then. This is fascinating to go through <coughs> the layers, you know, and take a drink when you need to take a drink. I apologize. I have a no, terrible cold it's here. it's good <laughs> that you're even here is good. Mm. <laughs> the, uh, at some point, citizens will need to let go of the way things have always been done. Right. So you give a nice example of the Regional Health Center and Heart Center out of St. John. Mm-hmm. Um, my interview with John McGarry two years ago when he was CEO of Horizon Health mm-hmm. spoke to the perfect situation New Brunswick has for regional health care delivery. Mm-hmm. If we can get citizens to let go of the expectation that every community has a hospital. Right. If we can get politicians to let go 
of using buildings and infrastructure as political windows for mm-hmm. ribbon cutting and gaining votes. Right. So I want to connect all of that because we can't pick just one part. Right. And and go, oh, we'll fix that. Because over here, there's going to be some chaos. Right. There's a letting go that needs to happen. Also tied to that is um, regional municipal governance structures. Mm-hmm. So there's some 350-odd local governance structures in New Brunswick in a population of 750, 760,000 people. Right. So you spoke twice to something that's going to require people to let go of the way it's always been done. Yeah. Well, it, it's about change fundamentally, and and I say to people, if if you're happy with the way New Brunswick is today, if you're okay with waiting eight to ten hours in emergency room, if you're fine with literacy rates rates being the lowest in the country, mm-hmm. if you're okay with the the high unemployment, if you're fine with taxes and everything else in the province, vote Liberal or Conservative, because that means you, you're opposed to change. If we want a different New Brunswick, you're right. I mean, we we have to change the way we're doing things. Mm-hmm. And we can't just simply tweak. That's what that's what every government does. And a blue government comes in, they tweak it. Liberal government comes in, they tweak it. Sometimes they make it a little bit better. Most times they make it a lot worse. Mm. We don't need tweaking. We need we need a real change and shift in the way we're governed. So to follow that theme and a challenge a bit, because this is what you must get on the doorstep. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you guys will never be in power, so why should I vote for you? But again, it's about getting the ideas into the legislature. First of all, I take, uh, you know, somewhat, um, I don't want to say offense, but, you know, <laughs> exception to the fact that we're not going to form government. And that that's, see, <laughs> politics is a funny game, yes. right? And they, 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 there's, a, there's a strategy, a political strategy that's being played by the two main parties. <laughs> the strategy initially was when we come onto the scene, just ignore them. <laughs> so it's a marginalization strategy. Just keep them on the fringe, ignore them, they'll go nowhere. Well, when we, when we are determined to, to continue to press on with these ideas and they start to see we gain a little bit of traction, well, then they try to ridicule you, right? And they make fun of whatever, this, that, the other, and they take things out of context. Well, what we're seeing now is it's gone from being marginalized to being ridiculed to being outright attacked. And, and this is the next thing. And, and the attack is you'll never form government. They won't be able to do anything. They know that's not true because the reality is when you get in the legislature, you now have a, a, a platform. You have a, you have a position officially within the legislature to be able to put these ideas forward and to hold governments accountable. Furthermore, if it's a minority government, you literally control the balance of power. Government can do nothing if we hold the seats in the middle to stop them from doing what we don't want to happen. Mm -hmm. So to say they're not going to be able to do anything, they know it's not true. Uh, I think most people know it's not true, and we've got to continue to make sure people know that it's not true. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, It's a myth. To follow that theme and maybe um, add an extra layer to it is that argument of um, you have to be in power in order to get things done. Mm -hmm. All 49 members of the Legislative Assembly are responsible for getting things done. Yeah. It doesn't matter who's in power. It's about governance and it's about maybe politics of cooperation for a change. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe some compromise for cooperation. So that's an interesting pushback to, well, you'll never be in power, so... Why, just, sh- why should I vote for you? But that also ties, and that's where I wanted to go, mm-hmm. to an awful lot of incumbent MLAs will justify their re-election based on the money they brought back to their constituency. Yeah. Is governance more than just what money you can get your for, con- for your constituency or what job you can get somebody that voted for you? Like, right. Are we ready yet to break that pattern? It, it's, it's, it's like this. Um, it, it's old politics, right? Mm-hmm. It's what always worked in the past. When I was a kid growing up, if, if you were a conservative um, supporter and the conservatives were in power, you knew you were going to work. Either you're going to DOT, you're going to MB Power, you're going somewhere for work because you supported the conservative party. If you're liberal, then you know you might as well just pack your, uh, your, your locker up and close it and you're not going back to work. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be out of work. Yep. That is changing. I mean, there's legislation now that, that kind of makes that. It still may happen, but it's a lot harder, <coughs> excuse me, for governments to do. I firmly believe what we have to do is we have to look at the whole picture of the province. And yes, it's important that, that local MLAs fight for their areas. That's what they're paid to do. That's what they should be doing. But what we have instead is we have MLAs that fight for their party. 
Hmm. And there's a big difference because we no longer have representative government. Now what we have is instead of a, a strong democracy, we have a, a type of partyocracy where it's the party's agenda that, that is being pushed forward regardless of what the people think. Uh, you look time and time again at how many MLAs have either been kicked out of caucus, have been reprimanded for simple things like asking questions on funding, uh, you know, stepping out of the party line, you know, they're whipped back into shape. Um, it's all it's all <clears throat> pieces of a puzzle that is, is hurting the province long term. Which then ties to another theme, which you and the Green Party and the NDP kind of represent. <clears throat> it's unofficially understood that the real control of the province isn't with those who are elected. Mm -hmm. It's actually with whoever's hovering in the background. Sure. The unelected people, um, male and female, mm -hmm. you can't say backroom boys, like mm -hmm. backroom club, mm -hmm. of where the agendas are really coming from and where the real power base is to mm -hmm. this point in time. Do you see having a mix? I mean, it's a bit of a simple question, but it's a chance to nurse it out a little bit. Do you see having a mix of the five colors in the legislature as a way of taking some of that power back from the people who are controlling your province but are not elected? Well, yes, and, and that's why we advocate strongly for, you know, um, again, getting more voices in the legislature. That's not a bad thing hmm. because what it does is it, it forces government to work with other parties where it's not just this one or two agenda that's moving forward in. You know, you can look at, you know, if, if you have the Liberal Party that, that comes out with whatever policy or law or funding announcement, mm -hmm. the Conservatives will automatically oppose it. Hmm. Even though the Conservatives did the exact same thing when they were in power just four years ago. Mm -hmm. And then it'll switch again, right? The Conservatives will come out with funding or policies or laws, and the Liberals will oppose it. So it just becomes just, just a charade mm -hmm. where if you have other parties in there, and, and again, when we're, when we're in the legislature, we're given the opportunity to make sure that everything is held to account. That if a funding announcement is made that we support, we think it's good, we can lend our voice to that and say this is a good thing. We're not tied to always opposing just for the sake of opposing hmm. or, you know, agreeing just for the sake of agreeing or that's what the party wants you to do. It's, it, it just opens the legislature up in a whole new dynamic. Playing with that theme a little bit about the five colors and five different perspectives in the legislature. Um, in doing some homework and talking to some different people, I believe that once upon a time, the structure for New Brunswick's <coughs> legislature literally were all independent candidates. Mm -hmm. And that it wasn't driven by political party agendas. Right. Some 80 to 100 years later, um, we're suffering under that political party backroom control mm -hmm. as opposed to you get to represent my constituency, but when you go to the legislature, you, 49, have to find a way to work it out. Right. Not unlike a city council. Exactly. Um, given that we're 750, 760,000 people, um, what would it be like if the legislature, would the legislature be functional if it was 49 independent candidates? Well, I, I think I think it could. I, I do think there has to be an overall direction. Mm. And and again, for people to say it simply can't work in the legislature, say, so, well, it works in every municipality. Toronto's got over 4 million people. Yeah. They don't have party agendas. They, they're, they're elected on wards and councillors, and they get together. Yeah. And obviously, if you're a councillor of a certain area, you're going to fight for your area. Yeah. That's the, what, the way it's supposed to work. But at the end of the day, the city still functions and does well. Yeah, that's one of the narratives that would be nice to emerge in this election because the counterpoint to, well, you'll never be in power or a vote for you or anybody else is a vote for the opposition or mm -hmm. that you're going to split, split the vote. Mm -hmm. All those myths that yeah. hover there beg the next question or the flip of that question is, well, how would it function if they were there? Right. And there are lots of examples, especially municipal governments, where there is no political party agenda, mm -hmm. but there's still a need to be cooperative and evolve into the next layer of governance. Sure, sure. And in and, and other jurisdictions, I, I don't know, I think it, if it's the Yukon, um, I believe they they run their, their territory as, a, you know, a basically independence. That there, there's not as much partisanship hmm. in, uh, in, in their legislature. I believe it's Yukon, but it's Northwest Territories or something. So there would be potential for a functional government, mm -hmm. in your view, if there were five voices in there. Sure. And this is what separates us as a political party, because what we have said 
is uh, our MLAs will have free vote. So, you know, in a four-year term that you're governing, there's always going to be different issues that come out in that four years. Now, if, you know, here in the next month or so, we're going to be putting out a platform. It's going to list, you know, some of the ideas and the vision that we want to do, which all the parties will do. Yeah. On those issues, when our MLAs are elected, I would expect our MLAs to, to toe the line on those issues because they were given the mandate by the people to do so. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So... On those issues in the platform, they, they, you know, they would be expected to vote in favor of those issues, those, those uh, policies. However, in those four years, there's all kinds of stuff. That legislation will be passed, policies will be changes, changed, funding announcements, all this sort of thing. It's those issues that the MLA has to go back to their, their, their constituents and represent them in the legislature based on how they vote. Free, free of party whip. Recently, Pam Lynch of the Conservative Party had a piece in the paper or was speaking out about a vote for People's Alliance would be like voting for the Liberals. Mm. Um, I've seen it flip the other way where someone says voting for the NDP is like voting for the Conservatives. It adds an awful lot of confusion for the many people who don't pay any attention to the last minute. And, and how to run an efficient democracy mm -hmm. and an engaged process mm -hmm with the two political parties doing that smoke and mirrors exercise of um, fear, mm -hmm. basically. Right. Um, you're going to walk right into it full-fledged, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not in it already. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a way of clarifying for people that it's a level playing field and there's five choices, not that you don't be afraid to vote? Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I did, you know, see see that article in her comments, and, and frankly, it's a desperation tactic. It's she realizes, um, you know, that that we are gaining steam, and uh, and and you know, things are looking very good for us in the election. So, again, it's it's the process of, of trying to, uh, you know, downplay the the opponent's ability to 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 govern and, and to get elected, but to get right to the chase. This idea that a vote for a certain idea, because it's not just a vote for a party, it's a vote for what the parties are saying, right? And people are gravitating towards what we are saying. So it's, it's the idea that people are voting for just as much as it is a party. So this, this concept that a vote for an idea is a vote for the liberals because it's going to split the conservative vote, it's this sense of entitlement that these two parties have. They just feel like... You know, if if uh, you know if if they have conservative members, that they'll always have conservative members, and they're entitled to that. And and I'm just of the firm belief that my vote is mine. I vote the way uh, I vote based on what I see, based on history, based on policies, based on ideas, based on the candidate, all different reasons. But that that's multi shaded. You know, blue, red, orange, green, purple. It's it is is irrelevant really at the end of the day. It should be about ideas. What what are, what ideas are being put forward, and and voting according to that. Following that theme, in the last provincial election, one hundred ninety eight thousand eligible voters did not vote. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific strategy or even general strategy to how to reach out to those people mm -hmm. to get them engaged again? Yep, and and that is a, a big one. And uh, if you look at even our last election. Uh, you know, there, there was in, in Fredericton Grand Lake a, 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 you know, a considerable amount of people that just simply didn't go out to vote. When I talk to people, and this, this is what's really encouraging for me, is I'm hearing all kinds of things. I'm hearing liberals that have been liberals for years, uh, some that have never voted any other way, are coming out and saying, look, we're done. Uh, we're, we're, we're done with the Liberal Party, and they're, they're, they're coming to us. We're having conservatives that are just not happy with the conservative party. They're not happy with the two-party system. They're coming to us. But more so is people I'm talking to say, I've never voted in the last couple of elections. But I can tell you what, when the polls open this, this election, I'll be there and you'll be getting my vote. Because they're seeing something fresh. They're seeing something new. It's not this stagnant old you know, a machine that just chugs along. It, it's, it's a different way of thinking. And people are gravitating towards that and, and we're building momentum because of it. So you're able to offset that sense of risk that some people feel with doing something new? Uh, yeah, well, like I said, to me, it's risky to keep voting the way you've always voted. That's the risk. Uh, look around at the province. Yeah. And again, it's not a hard sell. I, I just tell people, 
How are things working for you? Are you, you comfortable with the taxes you're paying? Are you comfortable with the services you're receiving from those taxes you're paying? Yeah. Uh, are you happy with the way you've been governed overall? Healthcare, education, your infrastructure? How's it working for you? Mm. And it doesn't take a lot to convince people. People automatically know it's not working well. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, again, my message is simple. If you're happy with it, keep voting red or blue because that's what you're going to get. If you want a different course for the province, you have to look outside the red and blue spectrum. Okay, to change tack a little bit, um, rural constituencies face so many challenges mm -hmm. from transportation to some economic development to even food security. Um, do you want to lay out some of your thoughts and your party's thoughts on getting at uh, some of the rural issues that New Brunswick has? Yeah. Uh, one of the big issues I hear among rural New Brunswick, well, I mean, there's, there's several. Uh, one of them is something as simple as high-speed internet. Now, I know governments have been trying to tackle this for years to, to get more access to high-speed internet to rural areas, but uh, I still talk to people that say they simply can't get reasonable internet access. Uh, it's almost like they're back to the dial-up days, you know, if, if they're not in, in urban areas. So I think that has to be looked at. Um, I think, again, getting back to people that live in rural areas do, for, do so for a reason. Uh, I, I live in the municipality of Minto, but Minto is a smaller community, and the area of Minto I live in is is rural. I mean, it's you know, it's it's beautiful. I love it. I live there because I love that way of life. I enjoy the woods. I enjoy that tight knit community where everybody knows everybody, and there's a community spirit that goes with that. That's what I like. Um, some people do it for those reasons. Some people do it for low taxes, whatever. But with that comes a reasonable expectation of government services. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of me living in a rural area is that I don't expect all the, the bells and whistles of, of government services, you know, that maybe someone in an urban area would expect. But my taxes are lower to kind of balance that out. So, but there is a certain base that anybody in New Brunswick should be receiving. If you dial 911 because you're in a medical emergency, you should not have to wait 30, 35 minutes for an ambulance to show up at your door. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So that's a basic service that everybody should receive an ambulance within 10 to 15 minutes at the most. An ambulance is at your door to, to, to help you out. Same goes for policing. Um, How about economic development? One of the great challenges for New Brunswick, and nothing's changed over the past 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. is uh, the key that unlocks that puzzle on what New Brunswick needs to do to put itself in good stead for the next 20 to 30 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. And some of that has to be rural economic development. Well, but maybe the process to it is different because in the past the behavior has been here's a big chunk of change from the government mm -hmm. and then there's a policy shift and then here's another big chunk of change. Yep. So following your theme of if you want to keep doing it the way we've always done it, then that's okay. Right. Do you have a part answer for what the rural economic development might look like? Well, I think if, if you're talking rural in terms of small, smaller municipalities, yeah. uh, if we were, you know, to throw that out there, I think <clears throat> there has to be more authority given to municipalities on how they tax. Uh, so if they want to draw in uh, industry, they want to draw in small business as a municipality, mm -hmm. if you have more authority on your taxation, um, you know, you can you can work with that to, to try to draw in what you're trying to draw in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I served on the village council in Minto for several years, and uh, uh, we couldn't so much as put up a crosswalk light without the province coming in and telling us we can do it. So th there's a lot of authority that you don't have as a municipality because the province overrides so much of it, and that can get frustrating. So I think if, if the provincial government would untie the hands of the municipalities, Again, in terms of taxation and other incentives or initiatives that they choose to do mm -hmm. to draw businesses, I think that would be good for smaller municipalities. Outside in the rural areas, I think a big draw, uh, again, would be high-speed Internet that is, you know, accessible and, and that everybody can work with. So what does that support then? Let's say, let's say you're able to put in high-speed Internet mm -hmm. and cover the province that way. What do you see happening because of that? Well, I think it would open the doors for businesses that maybe want to uh, operate in rural areas. Because let's face it, I mean, this day and age, it's, there's very few businesses that could operate or function adequately without high-speed Internet. I mean, you have to have that Internet access, whether it's through orders through email or you know, whatever you're doing through, through the Internet. So it is an important part to economic growth in rural areas. 
Um, but we're certainly open too. I mean, if there's other ideas out there to to grow urban area, uh, rural areas uh, with the economy, uh, we'd certainly be open to looking at those as well. Do you have any strategies thought up yet on micro businesses? I'm thinking food and farming. Mm. Um, do you have policies on food and food security? We, we've looked at uh, agriculture in the past. Uh, in our last platform, we did have agriculture as part of it. Uh, that's something we're going to look at going forward because I do agree New Brunswick has a huge untapped potential when it comes to farming, uh, you, know, uh, you know, our ability to, to have organic food, local food, and that is a big thing now. I mean, a lot of people, when they buy food, mm. and, and it's a good thing, they don't want it shipped from California if they can get it here in New Brunswick. Uh, it's fresher, it's, uh, you know, it, it sometimes is healthier and, and more organically grown or whatnot. So I, I, I agree. I think, you know, if we can, you know, navigate uh, around that and, and get agriculture back in New Brunswick would definitely be a huge boost. That also ties to the wellness movement mm -hmm. that um, the government, regardless of which party's in power, has been generating the past 10 or 12 years mm -hmm. about being healthier instead of dealing with more sick people mm -hmm. and trying to get at the proactive side instead of the reactive side. Right. Um, one of the other pieces that hover to come and bite New Brunswick one day um, is the impact of artificial intelligence on uh, so many areas of employment. Mm-hmm. So not long ago, Gwyn Dyer had a piece in the paper on um, driverless vehicles, self-driving vehicles, and the impact it would have on some 2 million jobs in the United States of the 4 million that are currently done in the driving industry from trucks and taxis right. and delivery thing. That might not happen in New Brunswick for a little while, mm -hmm. but you know it's coming. Right. It's already showing up in the food service industry where you walk into a fast food place and you order your own food by touching a tablet. And, right. Um, and there was a recent one on call centers where they've automated voices to such a degree now it has all the human cadences right. in it. Right. So since the McKenna era, New Brunswick's economy to a certain degree has been kind of pinned to trying to draw call centers to mm -hmm. New Brunswick because of high-speed internet to some key areas. That's all going to be gone within right. the next five to seven years. So I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but do you see or your party see what the next wave is to anticipate a major change that's going to happen in the workplace? Well, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I go back to the Allward Forestry Agreement that was made uh, under the previous Conservative government. And the idea was, was that industry was going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into upgrading their mills, and the government was going to give them more wood uh, and allocation, this sort of thing. My concern was that, okay, if you upgrade a mill, if you have, say, 10 people working the assembly line, well, if you're upgrading it, chances are it's going to be automated, or parts of it's going to be automated. Maybe you don't need 10 people anymore. Maybe now you only need six. Maybe you only need two. Mm -hmm. And again, this is anecdotal, but the, the concept mm -hmm. is there that... Well, Moose said went through that two, three years ago. Right. So businesses are constantly adapting. They're looking to cut their, 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 their bottom line. Um, that's the way businesses operate. I mean, you, you really can't argue with the private sector and how they do their, their business. Um, but from a government viewpoint, I think what's important is uh, the government's role of economic development has always been, let's bring TD Bank in here, create 300 jobs, and let's throw $9 million at it uh, in payroll rebates to get them here. Uh, that's, that's the ongoing concept. Give them money they'll come and create the jobs. That's a flawed concept because short term, it may work for the first year, two, maybe three. But if you look at the long term strategy, we're losing more money in the long term with that strategy than what we're gaining if we found different incentives. And what we believe in is things like lower taxes. Um, we, we've talked about eliminating, like say for example, the small business tax in New Brunswick, just eliminate it. By doing so, what you're doing is you're taking a, a, a huge burden off the current businesses that are here, but just as importantly, you're giving the opportunity for New Brunswick to market itself to the rest of Canada and the United States to say, we're open for business. And if you want to come to New Brunswick and move your business here, <coughs> excuse me, as a small business, you don't pay any small business tax. It just changes the atmosphere of the business environment in New Brunswick, and it would, ha I believe, have a marketing effect as well. All the pieces do connect, though, at some part. Mm-hmm. So in 2004, doing some research on the feasibility of a social planning mechanism for Fredericton area, I had a chat with Doug Motti, who was <clears> in the Enterprise Fredericton um, Executive Director. 
What's your biggest challenge to bringing business to New Brunswick? And with much respect, he said education. Hmm. Because in Ontario, where they were with their high school curriculum and where New Brunswick was with its high school curriculum, we're not in the same place. Right. So those families and the medium to small size businesses that would think about moving to New Brunswick were reluctant. You know, the taxes are there, the interest rates, the incentives from government, the electricity rates, their mm -hmm. community living. Mm -hmm couldn't address the other silo that wasn't his domain to talk about, right. which was education and it needing to shift. Right. Um, the, the challenges are complex because they interconnect that way. Do you have thoughts about, you know, from healthcare to environment to education, where you can do a business incentive, so no small business tax? Mm -hmm. Well, what else is going to need to go with that to make that be a reality? Because we definitely need a new way of doing things. Because mm -hmm. the old model's done, and there's too many demographic shifts and environmental mm -hmm. shifts mm -hmm. and economic shifts going on. That how do we take care of 760,000 people? Right, and 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 that that is that is the fundamental question. Because you're right, um, you know, like like we're convinced that eliminating small business tax would would help. You know, businesses that are here and bring new businesses in. But it is part of a bigger picture. You you have to be governed differently. And you have to be governed better. New Brunswick, like any other province or any other jurisdiction, only has so much money. And that's what a lot of it boils down to. Where does the money go? And is it getting the biggest bang for the taxpayer's buck as uh, possible? Like, like, like are, we, are we getting what we should be getting out of our overall budget? Mm -hmm. uh, health care, someone described health care to me as a big black hole. You can throw all the money you want at it, and it's just, it just will swallow it up. So... Money's one aspect, but on the other hand, efficiency and proper management in these departments is equally important because, like you said, you can throw money at something. That doesn't mean it's going to have the desired effect long term. And, I, and you're right. I talk to people that say, you know, uh, you know, moving to New Brunswick, um, again, education may be an issue, whether they're coming and they have kids that they want to enroll in the education system. They may be hesitant. Um, you know, if they're worried about, you know, um, medical issues, uh, you know, am I going to be seen at a reasonable time or am I going to be waiting 10 hours? Can I get a family doctor if I move, move to New Brunswick? It is. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a complex issue. It's a complex issue that we've got here because of bad decisions of liberal and conservative governments over decades. Um, it falls squarely on their shoulders. And I believe that it's time to hold them accountable and it's time to move New Brunswick in a different direction in how we think about how government services are supposed to be implemented and, and brought forward. Hmm. And just, just to add a footnote to that, um, we do an awful lot of things here really well. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking politics specifically. So it, it wasn't to shade it as a negative place to live. Or right. I was just pointing out a specific challenge. And the challenge for Mr. Mahdi wasn't so much about his resources. He had all kinds of resources. Mm -hmm. But he found he couldn't connect with what the main obstacle was because it's right. in another silo, which is education. That gets to politics. Yeah. Because that's the intersecting point of all the conversations, mm -hmm. which then points to a better process. Mm -hmm. um, this will be a bit of a turn, but it'll be interesting if we play with it a bit. Do you think it's possible to bring gratitude into politics? How, how so? Like... Well, are we grateful for everything we have? Yeah. Because compared to other places, you know, it, mm -hmm. we often define politics based on um, this is what I don't have or this is what I have to fight for. Right. Uh, compared to we have we have plenty. New Brunswick is <laughs> such a, it's such a, I don't want to say a contrast, but it's the only word I can come to my head. New Brunswick is a place where if you live here, you absolutely love it. I was out knocking doors in Marysville here last, well, it'll be a couple weeks ago now. And I met uh, a gentleman from his military. He moved from Ontario here several years ago. And he decided with his wife that regardless of what happens with his military career, he's not leaving New Brunswick. <laughs> Loves it. And I get it. I lived in Ontario for a couple years. <laughs> I hated it. You know, I couldn't wait to get back yeah, to New Brunswick. Yeah, but you're a good Minto boy. Yeah, well, I am. You know, I'm a small town boy. But I, I do. I, I love this province in so many ways. I, and, and there's so much... Um, that this province and the people is, and I know that's cliched, the people, but seriously, yep. the people here are truly dynamic. They're they're friendly. They're helpful. Uh, there's this community, you know, uh, spirit that goes with a lot of a lot of these areas. New Brunswick's awesome. 
what bothers me is is frankly i guess just how we're governed you know um if if we could take the awesomeness of new brunswick on that side and and how people love living here and couple that with good government man we we'd be the crown jewel of canada you know in so many ways so we got to connect the two and say look pe people love new brunswick but how do we make sure that it's governed right how do we make sure health care is reasonable you know where where you know, people don't have to wait two years for hip and knee replacements where we have enough specialists to look after the needs where, you know, you call again, 911, you got an ambulance there in a reasonable amount of time. Just just basic stuff. Get 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 more teachers and TAs in there. How, how do we work education to make sure that, you know, kids are getting a, a good education? Where the, you know, And again, it's not the teachers. The teachers are doing the best they can. I talk to them. They're, they're, they're as frustrated as everyone else. It's it's how they're governed. It's the decisions that are made on policy and 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 spending and and funding. It it all plays a part in in the overall system. It's a perfect place to stop. Mm, perfect. Th thank you. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, please take some time to support and share. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.